It's okay. <laughs> okay, hello guys. So, as Dr. Say said, my name is Saad Durrani. And before I begin with my presentation, I want to talk to you guys a little bit about my background. So, both my parents were born and raised in Karachi, Pakistan, and they moved here shortly after they were married. I was born here in Houston, Texas, but because I'm a first generation child, I've grown very close and very uh, knowledgeable about the culture and how Pakistan is. And in fact, each year since I was born, I've visited Pakistan, and to date, I've spent a combined total of almost three years within Pakistan. So because of this, this is a very unique opportunity for me, because I'm able to see how a completely different society lives and functions, and I'm able to see the challenges that they face that people here would not have even imagined are still being faced by people around the world. One challenge over there that I noticed was the air quality. So personally, I have asthma, and when I'm in the US, um, I don't really have an issue with the air quality here. I don't really have an issue with breathing. But when I do go to Pakistan, the second I step off that plane, the air just hits me. My lungs have to go into overdrive in, in order to produce the same amount of oxygen that they would if they were here. And I find that I have to use my inhalers on a regular basis when I'm over there. And this air quality issue is because of this scene right here. Now, the air may seem fine and the grass may seem green, but it's actually the traffic that's the major issue right there. So if we take a closer look at this traffic, this is actually not a busy time for traffic in Pakistan. In fact, this is what some may call a good flow of traffic, even though to us it seems very hectic and chaotic. Um, this is nowhere near what rush hour looks like over there. But if we take a closer look at this picture, the newest car that I can seem to find in this picture is a Toyota Corolla from the early 2000s. And let's take, another, let's take a look at another picture. This picture is also normal traffic. Um, and it seems that the newest car in this picture as well is an older sedan that may be from the early 2000s. Now, why is this an issue? All of these cars share one thing, and that is a combustion engine. Now, we all know that combustion engines are what make cars cars. They're what make them go. And the way they work is actually the issue. So gas enters the chamber at the top of the combustion engine, and then a small combustion um, happen, small explosion, which pushes the piston, thus rotating the gears and rotating the wheels on the car. Now, a byproduct of this combustion is black carbon and particulate matter. This is unprocessed gasoline that is given off into the environment and is often seen as the black smoke that comes out of your cars whenever they're not functioning properly. However, even when there's no smoke coming out of your car, your car is still constantly giving off black carbon and particulate matter emissions. Now, when, why is this an issue? When it's in the air, the particles get suspended and they absorb sunlight, thus increasing air temperatures. And then due to the global wind patterns, the particles gravitate to the poles and they settle on the ice caps where they continue to absorb heat and melt the ice caps because they're raising surface temperatures. Not only that, there are also health side effects. Asthma for one, bronchitis, but there are also very severe side effects that we do not see here in the first world that are being faced by millions in the third world. And all of these issues can lead to respiratory illness, pulmonary disease, pulmonary tuberculosis, infant mortality, and low birth rates. And it's becoming a wider and wider spread issue within the third world, within those countries. And in fact, in India, over half a million people die each year because of air pollution-related issues. Well, what are the differences in the standards? Well, if we look at the World Health Organization, they set 10 micrograms per cubic centimeter to be a good level for carbon particulate matter presence within any environment. Washington, D.C. has 12 micrograms per cubic centimeter, but if we look at a city like Beijing, they have 81 grams per, uh, micrograms per cubic centimeter. And then looking at New Delhi in India, they have 128 micrograms per cubic centimeter. That is almost 10 times what we see here in Washington, D.C. and our cities in the U.S. So, what are we doing about it? What are the automobile manufacturers doing about this? Well, ever since the automobile was created, really, um, manufacturers have been trying to create more hybrid engines. These are engines that use less gasoline in order to produce a bigger combustion and thus less byproduct of the gasoline and combustion process. And then in recent years, we've seen the introduction of electric vehicles. These are vehicles from Tesla, Ford, BMW, that obviously produce zero emissions given the fact that they're all electric. Let's look at this picture again. How many new cars do you see that may contain a hybrid engine? How many Teslas are in this picture? How many 
new BMW electric vehicles or um, Toyota electric vehicles are on this picture. Zero. And that's how the conditions are, and that's how they will remain within these third world countries for a long time. So where is the third world application of this innovation? Where is the third world application of what the automobile manufacturers are doing within the industry today? These people in the third world are not even able to think about affording those new cars. Take Pakistan, for example. The average yearly income of a Pakistani citizen is $1,513. People here make more in two weeks than what some people make in Pakistan in an entire year. So that is why we must ask ourselves, how is this research failing to help these people? How is this research failing to help all the people out there in the world? And so we've reached a point where innovation is not as effective as it was before. Innovation is not helping people as widespread as it used to be. What kind of innovation is going on for us? All the innovation is benefiting the first world countries, but is it benefiting third world countries? I, I took on this issue, and I wanted to see what the solutions to this specific problem were. So I asked myself, how can carbon particulate filters be used to alleviate the effects of black carbon? This is what I selected for my senior thesis project, and I decided to try and design a filter that could be hooked onto any exhaust pipe and collect the particulate matter before it's given and put into the atmosphere. So this, these were my first two designs, which I evaluated. They use filters, as you find in the coffee filters of your everyday appliance. And then I also considered a wire mesh filter. However, I found that that would be too expensive for my purposes. And after evaluating all the filters, I found that this filter would be the most effective in reaching our goal. So this filter maximizes on surface area, and it also maximizes on the amount of uh, particulate matter that's collected, because it uses a filter mesh median of 0.2 micrometer pore size. And that means that all of the microparticles that are between 0.2 micrometers and 2.5 micrometers are collected. So let's step back and think about what I just did. With absolutely zero resources, I was able to conduct research that may help billions of people in the world. And this is because I geared my innovation to help people that are not directly around me, but in the third world and in other areas. So this is truly where we have to gear our innovation. This is where the issue is becoming to be more evident because our innovation is simply innovating for the future. We're trying to push forward and reach this utopian society that we all wish to see. I mean, my fridge can access Twitter. Why does my fridge need to access Twitter? There's, there's so many different uh, innovations that are trying to increase and people are trying to push further and further into the future when we're leaving our friends in the third world country, be countries behind. We're leaving all of them in the dust. The technology gap is increasing by the day and people are failing to realize this. People are failing to address this. Large companies are failing to address this. If a large company such as Tesla, Ford, or Toyota were to allocate even a fraction of their resources to create a filter like I did, and they produced it and did deploy it in the third world, so many different aspects, so many different challenges that are faced by the third world would be reduced. So this is where I ask you guys, is the innovation that we see today effective? Is the innovation that's happening is it only benefiting us, or is it benefiting the, everyone in the world? Although there may be some innovation that's needed that we cannot use, but third world countries that use, that innovation is necessary before we can continue to reach a level where the entire world is at the same point, and we can continue to further that utopian society that we all wish to see. It is now, we need to, pres we need to innovate for the present and not for the future. It is important to make sure that everyone on Earth is at the same place before we can continue furthering. This is where the choice is yours. The choice is what innovation you um, support, what innovation you seek from companies, what kind of products you want to see. Would you like to see something that can maybe ease your life a little bit more, or would you like to see something that maybe saves thousands of lives for others? So this is where I charge you guys. Employ innovation that can help those that are in more need because it is that kind of innovation that's necessary in order to push us all forward into the future. Thank you.